is the new TCL 5 Series Google TV better than the Roku version? In some ways, yes. In others, no. And in the end, the most important question remains the same. Should you buy it? Welcome back everyone, I'm Caleb Dennison and this is my review of the TCL 5 Series Google TV. That would be the S546 model as opposed to the S535 model which runs on the Roku TV platform and came out earlier. We're gonna find out what's better about this Google TV version, what is not as good as the Roku version and why when you add it all up, you may or may not want to buy this TV. Before I dig in, I just wanted to say a heartfelt thank you to everyone out there watching, liking, and subscribing. I enjoy chatting with you in the comments. And with that in mind, I would love to know what are your top three movies to watch during the holidays? Notice I did not say holiday movies. They can be nature documentaries or old episodes of Captain Kangaroo. I can't wait for you guys to Google Captain Kangaroo. Anyway, what will you be enjoying at home between now and the end of the year? Put it in the comments, and if you like this video, hey, there's a button for that. And if you like this, consider subscribing. We try to have fun here while learning a little something. Thanks as always for your engagement. You put the you in YouTube, and without you, it would just be tube, which, never mind. Review time. Let's get right to some good stuff, shall we? The TCL 5 Series Google TV version is a brighter TV than the Roku version, and it offers 4K 120 hertz for gaming, whereas the Roku version does not. Although, it's important to point out that VRR is not available on this TV. So, from those two metrics alone, the S546 here has some improvements over the S535, but does that make it better? Well, yeah, in some ways it is better, but in other ways, it is not, so does it all balance out in the end? Let's get into that. So from a peak brightness perspective, this TV can do about 445 nits in SDR and between 650 and 750 nits for HDR. That right there makes this TV more desirable than the Roku version because I feel like this TV does do HDR some justice. The Roku version for me was like, not HDR. Still a good value, but I don't think it really earns that HDR badge, even though it does process HDR10 and Dolby Vision. Speaking of, one of the things I love about this TV is the little info pane that pops up for HDR10, Dolby Vision, and HDR10+. I pulled up season four of Goliath, and there was the HDR10 Plus logo. I like it when TVs give you that little bit of confirmation. Back to picture quality. Peak brightness is better. So too then is HDR, and the backlight control is pretty respectable. I watched the aforementioned Goliath at night with subtitles turned on, and honestly, I wasn't bothered by the backlight fluctuations the way I have been on some much more expensive TVs. So I consider that a bonus for the average viewer who does the subtitles thing but also for backlight control in general. It doesn't have the most zones, but it does have backlighting zones, and the VA panel on this TV offers good on-axis contrast. Off-axis contrast is, as expected, not nearly as good. There is no magic trickery to abate that inherent issue with a VA panel on this TV. Though I will say there is a good amount of anti-glare on this screen, and it does a solid job, better than I expected at this price point. Black levels on the whole are decent, Crushed blacks aren't an issue, but you do get some images where the black is closer to dark gray than you would get from a more expensive TV. Screen uniformity on this sample is not great. There are plenty of very easily discernible vertical segments on this TV, but they only show themselves when you have big swaths of uniform color, which frankly tends to be an issue mostly when you're watching ice hockey or something with a lot of snow or just really overcast skies. I watched two hours of TV shows and it didn't really bother me. So for most people, I don't see it being a big issue. So far, so decent, right? But now we have to talk about color. And folks, it is not great on this TV. And by not great, I mean the out-of-box color performance with the movie preset is not even in the same zip code as something that could be considered accurate. It's far worse than I expected. And when I try to correct the two-point white balance, that's where I'm looking for a good balance between red, green, and blue primaries on a gray slide. I couldn't do it. I could not easily correct this TV. And that's more work than most folks are willing or capable to do. So I don't think there's any point in talking about how you could get the color to be more accurate if you did a full-on calibration, which involves hiring someone and paying them a good chunk of change. 
not worth it. So if you are sensitive to colors and you want something close to accurate, this TV isn't going to do it. Those folks are in the minority though. I think a lot of folks would get this TV home and think the color was just fine most of the time. Passable, for a lot of people, sure. Passable is fair, I think. And if you haven't noticed, I'm trying really hard to be fair. Here's another issue. The upscaling of 480p content on this TV, also not great. We put in a Blu-ray of Gravity and watched for a while, and that's about as great a 480p source as you're gonna get. It wasn't very good. A lot of jagging lines and more eye effect. Also, the TV had a really hard time wanting to go full width with the 480p image. We had black bars on the top and bottom, which is to be expected for letterbox content, but the bars on the side should not have been there because it was a 16 by nine source. Then the problem just kind of went away. No idea why or if it'll come back, but I'm not thrilled about that. Fortunately, it does okay at upscaling 720p HD content, so if you're watching HD cable, it will be fine. If you're watching a non-HD channel on cable or satellite, it doesn't look great. It looks like I'm watching a DVD on a 100 inch screen, not a 65 inch screen, and I think that is something most folks will notice. As for sound performance, the TV does indeed emit audio, and I have heard worse, but not many. Get a soundbar. Even the cheapest soundbar will be an improvement. Enough said on that. As for gaming, as I mentioned before, I think the HDR picture looks good on this TV. I think the low luminance performance is just fine. My issue is gonna be around lower resolution games. It does have an auto game mode, which doesn't seem to wanna be as auto as I think it should be. And the input lag is sufficiently low, as is the case with most TVs with a game mode. 4K 120 performance is great for those few titles that support it right now. And I don't think I'm gonna spend too much time griping about the lack of VRR right now either. On the whole, it's fine, but nothing super exciting when it comes to gaming. Casual gamers should be fine. So if we're weighing things out, and we are, the higher brightness is definitely a plus. The 4K 120, well, let's call that a nice bonus. The upscaling, not great for low res stuff. And the color is not at all accurate, though that's less of a concern for the average viewer. Now I could almost consider that a balanced act with the Roku TV, except I think the brightness is a pretty big plus, but there's something I haven't talked about yet, and I must, because I think this could be a deal breaker for some of you. Bottom line, this TV has been a bit glitchy and laggy. I ran the software updates, it's connected via ethernet, so it's not hurting for bandwidth, and pure and simple, the TV is sluggish in its operation. Anytime I press the back button to get out of, say, a YouTube video, and I have to repeat myself, I'm not pleased. If I have to repeat myself more than once, I'm annoyed, and yes, I found myself annoyed by this TV sluggish operation regularly. To the point that I would rather buy a Chromecast with Google TV and use that every day than what's built right into the TV already. And aside from it being laggy, I and others I've spoken to report some just weird glitches from time to time. Like the image taking a while to catch up to a recent change that's been made, or some audio dropouts when switching from one input to another. And they're hard to duplicate. I think that's the frustrating part and why I'm using the word glitchy for all it's worth. It's the unpredictable oddities that keep surfacing that really keep me from being enthusiastic about this TV. If I don't have confidence in the experience someone is gonna get with just basic hands-on use of a TV, then I can't recommend it. So, should you buy this TV? That depends. I think that there are a lot of people out there who would get this TV home and be thrilled with it. But for the more discerning buyer, I think it's risky. Now, my hope is that some of these issues will be ironed out with future updates. And if they are, I will update this review to the extent I can. Given this is TCL's first go at a Google TV, I can forgive it for not being perfect, but the fact remains, it leaves enough lingering doubt in my mind that I'm just not ready to get behind it. And that's a bummer because TCL has thus far set the bar high for itself and others and often surpassed it. I think that's what we have come to expect from the company. My bet is the next generation of Google TVs are gonna be substantially better in many ways. Those are the TVs I'm excited to get my hands on. Thanks as always for watching everyone. What do you think about TCL's first Google TV? Leave me a comment down below about that. Don't forget to like and subscribe and here's two other videos I think you'll like.